even if it is flat, circles are flat. You stand in a circle. If you're above the circle, the horizon still looks curved. So that argument doesn't make any sense. And yet everyone seems to be arguing about it. I wanted to ask you about the P900 or now the P1000, the camera of choice among flat earthers. You did take an excellent photo of the ISS traversing the moon. This is my my first ever camera. Uh, He's a Springer Spaniel. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. Here's part two of my conversation with Dave McKeegan. Finally! In this video, Dave and I discuss his background in photography, the evolution of his YouTube channel, that time a flat earther challenged him to photograph the International Space Station, why the P900 and P1000 cameras are so popular among flat earthers, and more. If you haven't seen part one, there'll be a link to it in the description below. As always, if you enjoyed this video, let me know by hitting those like and subscribe buttons. And if you're not already subscribed to Dave's channel, you're missing out. His link will be in the description below. Thanks. And now on to part two of my conversation with Dave McKeegan. 2017, you started a YouTube channel, or at least that's when you started posting videos. Initially, they were all about photography. And then yes, sometime in 2022, I think September 22, you posted your first video that wasn't about photography. Well, actually it kind of was. It was about the photos from the moon landing. Did you remember making that first video? And what what made you go that route in that particular instance? Uh, You know, that wasn't actually the first conspiracy video that I did. Um, There was one other one that I did a few years back. I could probably dig it out somewhere. It's still on the channel. Um, Which was kind of the same sort of thing, but it it just didn't really gain any any traction. so why I did it was even though that was the first video or the, like kind of where I really took into dealing with it in videos, I was arguing with people about all of this on like Facebook and other platforms constantly for years. And what I found was I think it was I think it must have been around that time that it did an anniversary, one of the Apollo in floods and people were all asking, you know, putting the same questions forward. Why is the flag waving? Where are the stars? And same stuff over and over again. And whenever I was addressing people, like someone would post a comment and I'd want to try and correct them and inform them on the off chance that they are actually somebody who was genuinely asking the question. So I'd end up typing out these big, long explanations over and over and over again. And so I thought it'd be so much easier if I just did a video explaining all of this so that when I then get people commenting, it, I can just link them to the video and save myself a bunch of time. Right. Plus, like you say, the videos that I've was been, been doing up to that point were primarily all photography. So it, it's photography related. It still fits the channel. I thought I'll, I'll go with that. and then. Like you said, that, that video did very well. It's it's done well over a long period of time, but even initially it had quite a surge, which prompted a lot of backlash from sort of, you know, moon landing deniers then doing videos. And so that kind of got the ball rolling in terms of the next video that I did and then future videos as well. Yeah, that video was actually called Photographer Examines If NASA Moon Photos Are Fake. And yeah, that mm. ma- it made perfect sense. You're a professional photographer, an expert in photography, and this video at its core was a video about photography and lighting and perspective and things like that. Two more videos later came your first video that addressed flat. That also had a little bit to do with photography. That one was kind of a, a strange coincidence, really. Flat Earth was, again, something that I'd, I'd argued with on Facebook with people. And it was within one lot of comments, like so many people are posting memes going about how the horizon looks flat and the photography mind or whatever. And I'm just thinking, even if it is flat, circles are flat. You stand in a circle. If you're above the circle, the horizon still looks curved. So that argument doesn't make any sense. And yet everyone seems to be arguing about it. And then I was sat editing videos one night. In fact, I'd done a video. And so you see on the, the channel, it kind of did moon landing, moon landing, and then a couple of flat earth, and then one random video that was fisheye versus rectilinear lenses, which was one that, again, was sort of related to those kind of arguments of they're just using fisheye lenses and, and trying to you know kind of explain the differences between what fisheye actually means versus rectilinear and so i was in the middle of planning that video out and then youtube just recommended one of ftfe's debates and it was i noticed it because it was down as actually live at the time was why i thought flat earth debate they're actually debating this live 
And then I watched about 20 minutes of it, got a headache and thought, I need to make a video about this. It's amazing to me that that argument is not put forward more because, I mean, you hear it all the time, the argument that the horizon is flat, but it is such an irrelevant argument from a flat earther. They're disproving their own model at the same time. As you said, it would have and, to be a square earth. And even then it wouldn't make perfect sense. Yeah. And, and the thing is, they don't even consider their own arguments when they put when they come back. Because the, the argument I put was to say, you know, Earth is a disk, which I know that's not what flat Earthers overall say, but you know, even if it's flat, if it's round, it's got a flat horizon. And then they say, yeah, but, but we can't see that far. But then if you can't see that far, there's a limit to how far you can see. That limit will be the same distance in all directions, which still makes a circle around you, which would still not be flat. Even if you say, oh, well, we can only see 10 miles. Well, I can see 10 miles in that direction, that direction, there and there. It's still a circle. It, it's still not flat. There's no scenario that would create a straight horizon. And yet flat earthers still argue that the horizon's straight. I understand you've been passionate about photography since you were a child, essentially. Is that true? Yeah, kind of, even though I might never have realized it, but I, I always enjoyed taking photos and then being able to look back in years gone past and sort of reminisce about about those photos and I, and I still do it today you know I've got photos all around the house and occasionally I just find myself sort of stopping and kind of remembering those moments so photography for me was always uh obviously capturing those important memories and being able to treasure them and yeah took it took it from there really cameras must have come a long way since you were a child yeah yeah in fact I, I still have I think my very first camera is in the cupboard just over there if you want me to go and go and grab it oh uh, yeah yes I'll show, show you my, my yeah. first ever yeah, camera sure. Yeah, show us. Is it a 35 millimeter or a Polaroid? Oh, sorry yeah. about that. It's buried, but this is my, my first ever camera. Is it a little airplane? Yeah, little airplane, little viewfinder on the back, and the uh, the film cartridge went in there. And that was the that was the first ever camera that I owned. And uh, granted, I think I wanted it more because it was an airplane rather than a than a camera. But nice. yeah, that was the that was the first ever camera. That I, that I got. I can't remember how old I was when I got it, but yeah, that's some reason I've, I've still got it. Is everything you do digital nowadays? Does anybody use actual film and develop it in a dark room like back in the day? There are still photographers that, that prefer the old school method of doing it with film. Uh, personally, I, I don't. By the time I got into photography properly, everything was, was pretty digital and all the cameras apart from that one that I've, I've properly owned have all been digital. Um, but there are still photographers that that stick to the film either because it's always what they've what the, what they've used, or some of them say that there's there's a look to film photography that you can't truly replicate with digital. You think that's true? Yes, and no, to some extent. A lot of it is, I think, the lenses as well. Manufacturers have come on a long way with the way lenses work, and and now a lot of the photographers they want lenses to be as close to perfect as you can get in terms of the sharpness and the overall rendering, but that kind of takes some of the character out of the lens as well. I want to ask you about the P900 or now the P1000, the camera of choice among flat earthers. Why is that camera so popular among flat earthers? What is the deal? Um, I think it's, it's the marketing aspect. The fact that it's advertised as having such a long uh, zoom that, you know, it kind of makes uh, cameras like that have been around for, for, years with with fairly broad zoom ranges and they're popular because they're pretty versatile for someone who's not that bothered about say not that bothered about photography but they're not they're not making a, a profession out of it they just want a camera for capturing day-to-day -day things having a long versatile zoom range is really useful because it gives you a lot of flexibility in having just one camera with you and being able to cover you know everything from a really wide angle shot to picking out something way off in the distance. And I think flat earthers have latched onto it because it's advertised as having this really long zoom. So they think, oh, we should be able to pick out these things way off in the distance. The camera is, it's okay for what it's what it's supposed to be as just a general camera. But in terms of what you actually get out of it, it's not really that good, which is why professional photographers don't use them. You said it has a strong zoom. A camera with such a strong zoom and a reputation for that How's it compared to a two hundred dollar telescope or a pair of binoculars? Well, that that's the thing. It's not really that good. Um, the 
although it's advertised as having a three through effective focal length, it's not actually three through. It's only five hundred and something. Um, it's just the sensor on the on the camera is so small that it, it it crops in essentially. So you're only seeing a very small portion of of that focal length, which makes it look like it's it's much tighter. So for like the cameras that I use. I would need a 3,000 millimeter lens to get that field of view. But that telescope's millimeters, I think. But if I put eyepieces on it, I can make it 3,000 mil. But that telescope is going to be way better than than any kind of tiny little camera. And then it's, you've got like the quality of the optics as well. You know, a, a telescope or a, a lens with a fixed focal length, the optics in it are designed to be effective, to be best at that focal length. Whereas you have any zoom lens, the quality drops off at the extremes because all the glass is moving around inside. So generally for any zoom lens, they say the, the widest and longest focal length are where they said it's worst, which is usually where flat earthers tend to use it. Right. And it's limit. Yeah. What does the P900 go for? A thousand dollars or something along those lines? Somewhere around there. Yeah. I want to talk about the challenge and your experience photographing the ISS. That's another thing that flat earthers have to claim is fake. Pokey, I think was the person who issued the challenge to you. Deemed you yes. as trustworthy. All other photos are fake, but if you take one, they'll believe it's real. You did take an excellent photo of the ISS traversing the moon. What, what was that experience like? How hard was that, uh, even as a professional photographer? I'll be honest, that wasn't that difficult in the, in the sense of, in that moment, it was nerving, you know, the pressure of, of trying to get it, but actually in terms of complexity, it wasn't that bad. It was just the planning of finding when it was going to be transiting you know, is the weather conditions going to be right? So some of the transit times are in the middle of the night and it wasn't always logistical for me to, to try and get it. But once I found a night that was suitable and the weather was good, it wasn't actually that difficult because I knew it was going across the moon. I knew exactly where I was aiming for. You know, yeah, seeing that's... the ISS normally, the hardest part for me is if I know it's supposed to be nearby, but it's just going to be a dot in the sky and then sort of, trying to keep my eye out where is it hope i don't miss it but if i know it's going across the moon and exactly when i know it's going across the moon it's not like i have to react to anything it's just you know point the camera at the moon and wait until that time and then take some pictures i, I did look up on the website to see if i would be able to find the iss traversing the moon in my area i was shy like i couldn't find a single instance over two months whatever span it left you and I, I put in like 180 yeah. kilometers. I guess it's just all luck of your locations. I put in a location down in Florida where my parents are at, and two weeks from now, it'll traverse right across. If you, you know, yeah, I mean, it depends it. Where, where, roughly, where are you in the US? Yeah, exactly. I'm in New York. I don't know if, it, if ever. Oh, it must... New York's probably. I know, I know from like where I am, for example, like the, the ISS orbit doesn't come as far north as me so it never goes truly overhead it's always off to the south so if you're at quite high latitudes it's it's harder to, to find it um, i wonder yeah, yeah. So I, tried, I tried every combination i couldn't find a single time there would go across the moon first shot when i to my parents florida address boom like uh, two yeah. weeks it'll go across and then two weeks later after that it'll go across like, oh, oh, yeah wow. it's it's one of those it's sort of some of its look of the draw you've got to travel for it but in terms of actually doing it it's it's pretty straightforward, especially like I think I made it more complicated by the fact that I wanted to photograph it rather than just film it. You know, there's, there's examples where people just set the camera up, looking at the moon and record it and you'll see it going past. It's just not as clear. I mean, Jaron did that himself a few years ago. In fact, he's very miffed at me for, for mentioning that. <laughs> he doesn't like me for it because I, I'd remark that he'd film the ISS and then took down the video and the reason why he took down the video wasn't because he was trying to hide anything. It was copyright strikes, but I didn't actually know anything about that at the time. I just made the remark that he'd removed the video because MC Toon had mentioned it a, a couple of weeks prior. So, um, yeah, I ruffled his feathers. But, he, you know, he managed to do it just by set the camera up, point at the moon. As long as you know at the time what time it's going to go past, and you can see the moon, it's not that difficult to do, but obviously getting the really good results is where it's a lot harder. I think if you look at some examples where like the astronomers have done it, 
you know, they've got bigger telescope rigs and they're actually tracking the ISS rather than just, you know, finding a fixed spot and waiting for it to go through. They're actually picking it up and following it with the, with the telescopes, which, you know, I've got no chance in hell of doing that. They don't do that manually, do they? Don't. I don't know. I've seen I've seen some that look like they are actually just pivoting the telescope by hand, like through wow. an eyepiece, which is probably a lot of practice. And I suspect that the finished product has got a lot of stabilization to the footage to to get rid of some of the jitters. But you know, it's doable, I suppose. How do you focus on something that's moving so quickly and is so small? I can't barely get a focus on the moon. How do you focus on this little thing that's somewhere in between? I didn't. I, ju I just guessed. So, like, my telescopes, it's it's got a, a focuser on it, but all I kind of did was I focused on the moon and then just brought it, brought the focus sort of slightly forward of the moon and just sort of thought, that'll do. So I think the actual photos that I took, the ISS, isn't properly in focus. I was just sort of ballparking it, thinking as long as it's there or thereabouts that... You know, you can clearly see the outline of it, then that'll do. But I suppose it would probably be, probably be more along the lines of if you maybe captured it a couple of times. You know, you could you could adjust the adjust the focus as you're doing it each time, maybe as long as you know roughly how far away the thing's focusing, which would be the height of the ISS. Then you could probably plan it in advance. But I didn't I didn't do any of that. I just sort of guessed it and hoped for the best, really. Yeah, I mean, I know you overlapped some of the photos and increased the quality in that with that technique, but it came out great. Is that your favorite photo you've ever taken? You've taken some great photos. Who's your favorite? I don't really have a favorite. I, I say kind of have favorite photo that I've taken. There's some photos that I've taken that have really, you know, maybe I've found challenging or, or ones that I've wanted to do. Like there's a, I've got a photo hanging up on my wall the in in another room of the Andromeda Galaxy that I took a few years ago, which was one that I've, I, most people look at it and they go, "Wow, that's amazing." Compared to other photos of Andromeda, it's not that good, and and it's what, something that I've wanted to redo, but just not got round to it for one reason and another. But uh, yeah, that that was one I took a few years ago where it was like about an hour of standing there taking pictures with the camera moving the camera slightly after every couple of minutes because obviously it's moving across the sky and then layering them all up and and playing around with the edits a little bit and got at the, at the time i thought yeah it's pretty good and then you see some of the ones that you know professionals but like kind of more professional uh, astrophotographers get and you're like yeah that mine looks garbage this was literally my next question for you do you know johnny harris the youtuber are you familiar with not him not off the top of my head i, I might have seen him but I, yeah i don't know. he makes three videos he has a couple of million subscribers and he posted a video i think it was about three years ago how i took a picture of a galaxy the goal that nearly ended me it seemed like for all the things he has done this was his biggest challenge. It took, I don't know, it's been a while since I've seen it, but maybe six months of planning and learning. Because he's not a photographer by any means, at yeah. least not that I understand. So how tough was that for you? Because he made it out to be climbing Mount Everest in a sense. Um, I think I probably had the benefit of understanding about it before I tried it. You know, I had a fairly solid grasp in terms of astrophotography and so when i come to doing andromeda it wasn't really a big step out into the unknown for me it was just aiming for something different basically the, the challenging part was was more one being able to find it because it's quite dull in the sky it doesn't obviously look like a big galaxy it's just by eye it looks more like just a star maybe a slight smudge so First, being able to find exactly where it was in the sky, getting it in focus is difficult because you can't see it to properly focus on it. And every time you try and focus on it, you're then nudging the lens so everything's moving around. So you've kind of got to nudge the focus slightly, take a picture, see whether it looks right or not. Trial and error, basically, until you've got something that looks about right. And then it's the arduous process of, like, say, take a photo, take move the camera slightly because it's moved and then just repeat and repeat and repeat for as long as you as long as you want and then getting them all into onto the computer and, and layering them over it's time consuming but like i said that that kind of that editing side of things and doing the stacking is stuff i'd already done before so to someone who's never done any of it you know it would be 
a huge uh, task to try and do all in one go. Yeah, I think it took him six months. And I remember certain aspects of the video where he was saying the size of just the, the data that he would come back with. And he wouldn't, you, you wouldn't know. I think you wouldn't know if you got a good shot until hours later or something like that. It's not like you can just like, oh, let me go and check that out. Oh, no, that was a little blurry. Try again. But that's cool. So you actually have a picture of Andromeda on your wall inside That's that you took. That's amazing. Yeah, so, yeah. But, yeah, I can, if I can screen share here. Wow. This is what you saw from where you live? Well, that, I mean, that's in the back garden, oh. but that's not, that's not a one photo. That's, that's the finished thing after quite a bit of, I, I think it was probably about a hundred and something photos that have all been layered over each other. And then I've, I've had to tweak around with the the contrasts and the likes to bring out the detail so actually the the raw photo that came out the camera doesn't look anything like as as detailed as as that that was the finished one that i got but when you actually see it kind of up close it's you know it's not as as detailed it's a bit blurry so you know a lot of people look at that and go wow that's really good and I'm like yeah, i was really impressed with it and now seeing how other people do it and i'm like shit <laughs> well wow. Was this even possible 40 years ago? I mean, before digital cameras and you only had one shot, there was no, none of this digital editing. Yeah. And... Yeah. The, you know, you kind of digitals, digitals open up a whole new expanse of, of what you can do in terms of, of creating photos, you know, with, given the flexibility of being able to layer numerous images. I, I don't think yeah. any of that would have ever been possible with film. You could, you could obviously photograph it, but if you compare like the, the first photos of Saturn that were taken, you know, when, when Galileo and the likes could, could start observing the, the planets, what they were able to, to capture in those days versus what we can see now of it is just worlds apart for, for exactly this same reason. Do you have a photo of Saturn handy? I remember looking at Saturn through a telescope here. I'm just curious to how it compares. I'm trying to remember where I stored everything. I, I was out. I don't get to do as much astro as I used to be able to. And in fact, here we go. Just for give you some idea here. I have a feeling it's going to be a lot better than what I saw through a telescope. I didn't get Saturn. I got, um, I was looking at Jupiter. One working. Oh, no. Here we go. I've got one. Share. Share. So. That's that's what I was able to get. That's one photo, but it's it's not properly in focus, I don't think. Um, and the moons are just sort of visible, I think, off to the sides. But it would it would need quite a lot of stacking and, and taking extra photos and stacking to get a good result. So, you know, I was able to see it, but it wasn't great. And then I've also got that's still better than what bring, I was able to see with um. A five hundred dollar telescope. It's yeah, a lot better, actually. Bring up. So that is one of the raw photos of Andromeda that I took. So that's Andromeda there. Even th even through a telescope, it it doesn't really look more than just a smudge. Yeah, looks like a star. And it's only when you, yeah, but it's only when you've taken lots of them and edited them to get and you know kind of merged them all together that the detail of the actual galaxy itself is able to become apparent. Yeah, what a difference though. If this was anything like the pre-digital versions, I mean, this is this is cool, but it's nothing compared to the actual end result that you were able to no. produce. Yeah, not even close. Would anyone even know that that's a galaxy? But I mean, they had better dead telescopes, much better than the camera, but I don't even think I would recognize that as a galaxy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like bigger telescopes, you'd probably be able to see it clearer. Um, the way that I've photographed it's probably not ideal. It's not completely in focus. The stars are slightly out. So I was just playing around with the tracker that I've got on my telescope's not working properly. So it wasn't tracking as well as it should have done. So most of the shots were blurred. So I gave it up as a bad job. And then the weather turned south and now Andromeda's no longer visible for the next sort of couple of months. So I may try again later in the year. That's pretty amazing. So this is through a telescope. I don't know. Is that in the frame or? Through the one behind you? Yeah. 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 So, so that, that it was that telescope and then, and then my Sony camera on the back of the telescope. Are they designed to fit cameras so you can take photos of what it sees? Yeah. There's a, a little adapter that you can get that basically connects to the, to the camera and then lets the camera fit into where the eyepiece of the <laughs> telescope would normally go. The only time I get to see a good view of the stars when I'm camping in upstate New York, and then it's like a totally different world. You need to really get out of the city to be able to, uh, to appreciate the night sky. I will get comments on this video saying that you and I didn't present any evidence for a globe. Meanwhile, that wasn't the point of this conversation. 
of you in the comments who are going to say that, go check out Dave McKeegan's channel and you'll have the evidence you're asking for. Dave, thank you so much for doing this. I, I hope maybe we can do this uh, again in the future. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks very much for inviting me. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, don't forget to hit those like and subscribe buttons and check out my other videos. I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Uh, he's a Springer Spaniel. Cool. It's very sweet. But this right. is my this is my dog. I have a golden retriever. This is my dog while I'm working. Yeah, I mean that kind of started. I mean, technically he's he's not my dog. He's he was my girlfriend had him before I met her. Um, oh. and then I uh, started spending more time at her house. So I was doing videos. If you watch through my videos, you'll see I shift from doing it in my bedroom, which is my pet at my old parents' house, um, to in her house when the kids were at school. So it would just be me and him in the house. And so we tend to just keep coming and sitting next to me during the videos. And I kind of just, I was on a sofa at the time. So we just sit on the sofa and then he'd come and go. And I just left him to it. And then people started commenting about it. And if ever I did a video and he wasn't in it, people were like, Where, where's the dog? So, and yeah, now to the point that if, if I'm ever here doing work, he'll be sat right there on the chair. And if I go to film a video, he's there before I am. And yet everyone th seems to think that I'm making him sit there. I'm like, I'm not. He's just, that's where he chooses to be. And I invade his space.